This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Agun Erev Shabbos. I want to thank Reb Lior and Evan for and the Rimon Advisory, and what? And Reb Gary, for, and the Rimon Advisory for uh, sponsoring uh, this year and this whole trip. Baruch Hashem, so far it's been a huge success, and we, ho- we look forward to even more shiurim. Okay. You know, the, the Gemara tells us that the proper method in life in terms of balancing one's livelihood with learning Torah is that the language the Gemara uses is Haneg Bohem Minag which literally means it's not, a, it's not sufficient just to learn but you need to also have a livelihood because you could sit and learn all day but the money is not going to come in through the window so you have to do hishtalos, you have to put in your human efforts and you also have to make efforts towards understanding Hashem and creation. But there's another interpretation. Rabbi Chaim Elazhner says, Hanig bohem minag In the work, in the job that you do, in the activities that you do, Hanig bohem minag you should also be learning. In other, in other words, on the ideal sense, and this is not a level that we're on, by ideal sense, while you're working, you should be thinking and learning, which today we would call that gross negligence. You know, if somebody would be <laughs> learning Torah while they were working, they would be uh, coming up with a, p- a poor product. But at the very least, if we can't do that, so if we intersperse during the day time for limana Torah, so you're fulfilling the ideal of Hanig Bahem Minagdar Okay, so what, what I would like to speak about briefly this afternoon, it is the Arab Shabbos, even though for me it's Thursday really, <laughs> but... Um, I'm actually very happy about this week because this week um, I get to go five days and then Shabbos. So I'm trying to figure out how next week I could fly somewhere and have four days to Shabbos and then maybe we'll have Shabbos the whole week or something. But uh, I want to speak about miracles in the Torah. Specifically, to compare three eras in history and analyze the relative ease or lack thereof of how easy or difficult was it to bring a miracle, to create a miracle? And um, we will begin with the Gemara Masech Techulen. Okay, if, you, if I say a word and you're like, what's that? I don't, I don't know that word. Say, Rabbi, please translate. But um, the Gemara tells us in Masech Techulen about a Tana by the name of Reb Pinchas ben Yoyer. Reb Pinchas ben Yoyer, according to the Talmud Bavli, was the son-in-law of Reb Shimon bar Yechai. And according to the Zohar, he was the father-in-law of Reb Shimon bar Yechai. And he, the Gemara tells us he was traveling to fulfill the mitzvah of Pidyon Shvuyin, which means redeeming captives. And that's a very important mi- a mitzvah if a Jew is held captive by an oppressor. It's a great mitzvah to try to redeem them and to free them and to rescue them. In fact, the uh, Sefer Tanya writes that any time a person goes to perform the mitzvah of Pidyon Shvuyim, their soul is accompanied by the soul of Rav Pinchas ben Yar. Okay, so Rav Pinchas ben Yar was going to redeem a captive. And uh, there was one problem, that in his way was a river, the river Ginoi, Nahar Ginoi. So Rav Pinchas ben Yar then spoke to the river. Like, what else do you do if you're trying to get somewhere and there's a river in your way? So Pinchas ben Yar addressed the river. He said, split, chalokli meimecha, split, so I could cross. So the river says, do you know who you're talking to? I don't understand. I'm doing the will of God, certainly. You may not be doing the will of God. In other words, I know that by flowing, I am fulfilling the will of God. When God created me, river, God created me to flow. So if I flow, I am doing the will of God. You, on the other hand, you may not be fulfilling the will of God because maybe you'll be successful, maybe you won't be successful. So there's a principle in halach, and this is a... A, a principle in secular law as well. It's called Ein Suffolk Motamide Vadai. You're not going to have a doubtful situation extract from a certain situation. In other words, the river says, I'm doing what I need to do, but you may not be, it could be you won't be successful in doing what you need to do. So, Reb Pinchas Ben Yar says, not, not so fast. If you don't split, I'm going to dry you up and you'll never flow again. So, Pinchas Ben Yar threatened the river. So, the river got scared. And the river said, fine, I'll split. And the river split for Reb Pinchas ben Yar. There was a guy walking behind Reb Pinchas ben Yar. He was carrying wheat to grind up to make matzah for Pesach. So Pinchas ben Yar says, why are you only splitting for me? You should split for the guy who's carrying wheat for the carbon Pesach. So the river split a second time. There was an attendant accompanying them, an Arab attendant, an Arab uh, shamash, an Arab uh, assistant. 
Rabbi Pinchas ben Yar said, you need to split for him as well, because otherwise it would not appear nice and polite that the river is splitting for me and not for our attendant. So the river split uh, three times. Did Rabbi Pinchas ben Yar have an easy time splitting the river? Yes. All it took was a conversation. Imagine, we went to the harbor, we wanted to cross the harbor. Imagine if I addressed the harbor and said, look, I'm here from New York, you know who I am? I'm a rabbi from Brooklyn, okay? Please split immediately. So you, I don't know if you heard on the news yet, but it did not split. The river did not split, okay? But yet Rabbi Pinchas ben Yar was able to walk over to a river, address the river, and split the river. He had a very easy time splitting the river. On the other hand, let's go back to the Chumash, let's go back to the Bible, let's go back to the story in Parshas B'Shalach. Moshe Rabbeinu and 600,000 Jews come to the Yamsuf. What does the Yamsuf do? Nothing. The Yamsuf doesn't budge. In fact, the Medrash says that the, the sea spoke back to Moshe and said, Moshe, I'm not splitting. I, the water, was created on the third day of creation. You were a man, you're a human, you're a man, you were created on the sixth day of creation. I'm older than you, you're not going to split for me. So what did Moshe Rabbeinu have to do? He had to show the sea, the coffin of Joseph, of Yosef HaTzadik. And one, what did the sea do? Nothing. And then our sages tell us, Chazal say, they had, Moshe Rabbeinu had to present the b'risa of Rabbi Shmuel, the b'risa of Rabbi Shmuel. And even so, the sea didn't split. And then what happened? There's a man by the name of Nachshon. And Nachshon ben Aminadav jumps into the sea. And what does the sea do? Nothing. So Nachshon ben Aminadav goes up to his knees. And what does the sea do? Nothing. And then Nachshon goes up to his waist. And the sea doesn't split. And he goes up to his shoulders and the sea doesn't split. He goes up to his chin and the sea doesn't split. He goes up to his mouth and the sea doesn't split. He goes up to his nose and he cries out, Hoshieni kibo mayim anofesh. Save me because the, the water is about to destroy me. And only then does the sea split. So could you imagine... What Moshe couldn't do, with 600,000 Jews standing on the sea, Moshe couldn't say, split or I'll dry you forever. What Moshe could not do, Reb Pinchas ben Yar was able to do. How's that possible? Moshe Rabbeinu was the greatest Jew who ever lived. Moshe Rabbeinu, Chazal tell us, was equal to all 600,000 Jews. How could Reb Pinchas ben Yar accomplish what Moshe Rabbeinu was not able to accomplish? Okay, that's the question. And the Or HaChaim HaKadosh, one of the great classic commentaries on the Chumash, explain that there's a basic difference between Reb Pinchas ben Yar and Moshe Rabbeinu. There's no question that Moshe Rabbeinu was greater than Reb Pinchas ben Yar. However, Reb Pinchas ben Yar was fortunate to live in a period of history that came after the Torah was given. And once the Torah is given, the keys of the universe and the controls of the universe are now administered by those who have mastery over the Torah. You see, before the Torah was given, God created a world. And the world has natural law, principles. So, if I take this and I drop it, it's going to fall. There's nothing, that's just the way it's gravity. Sir Isaac Newton had, uh, you know, experienced it the hard way. Okay? But there are a certain phenomenon of nature and of the physical world that there are laws of the universe. Before the Torah was given, nature would always run its course. And if Moshe Rabbeinu would come to the sea, and Moshe would say, split, the sea would say, what do you mean split? God created me to flow, not to split. And Moshe Rabbeinu is going to have a very difficult time splitting the sea. However, Rav Pinchas ben Yoyer lived in a time after the Torah was given. Once the Torah is given, the world was created for the purpose of learning Torah. Even though it doesn't look that way. It doesn't look that way. It looks like there's a beautiful city and a beautiful world and people work and people go home and people have families and people have leisure and it's hard to know what is this world all about. But uh, 3,300 years ago, God gave the Torah to the Jewish people in front of three million eyewitnesses. And this has nothing to do with the share, but it's just worthwhile to point out. No event in the history of the world was authenticated by more eyewitnesses than the giving of the Torah. It's a fact. You know, I think uh, Obama's presidency was witnessed by how many people? Only a million people. Now, do you believe he's the, he was the President of the United States? I can't believe it, but 
We have to accept it as fact because there were one million eyewitnesses. The fact that it was on television doesn't mean it happened. Almost nothing that you see on television happened. The fact that you read it in the paper, that if anything means it didn't happen. Okay? The only way we know that he was the president because there were a million eyewitnesses. No event in the history of the world was authenticated by more eyewitnesses than three million Jews who stood on Mount Sinai who saw God give us the Torah. Every other religion, one guy had a dream and he told everybody else about it. So if you want to accept what one guy tells you, that's your problem. But what we saw with our own eyes, that you can't. So once the Torah was given, and now God is telling us, the purpose of creation is for the, a person to recognize the divine by studying Torah. Along with learning Torah goes the control over the universe. Therefore, a Pinchas ben Yar who lived after the Torah was given, he was able to go to a river and say, I don't care what you're programmed to do. From now on, I control the universe. The keys are in my hands. And I'm telling you to split. If you don't split, I'm going to dry you up. This principle that Archaim HaKadosh could answer an interesting difficulty raised by the Ramban in Parshish Chayisara. We know that Avram Avinu had camels. And the Torah talks about how Avraham muzzled his camels. Why did he muzzle his camels? Rashi says, because he didn't want them to eat someone else's grass. You know, you could be a very holy man, but you have to not only be holy in prayer and study, but in also how you value other people's property. And Avram Avinu did not want his camels to eat somebody else's grass. So the Ramban asks, that's impossible. You cannot say that Avram Avinu needed to muzzle his donkey because he didn't want his camel, because he didn't want his camel to eat someone else's grass. Says, says the Ramban, don't you know, there was a man by the name of Pinchas ben Yair. And Pinchas ben Yair had a donkey. And one time the donkey was hungry, and someone tried to feed it food. And the donkey asked, but is it kosher? Well, literally, t- exactly what happened was, that it was food that truma had not been taken off. T- taken off. It was not tithe. So for all practical purposes, it wasn't kosher. And Rav Pinchas ben Yair's donkey would not eat non-kosher. Can you imagine? Back in the day, even the donkeys were observant. Okay? So the Ramban asks, if by tzaddikim, if by the righteous, even their animals are holy, then why would Avram Avinu have to muzzle his camel so his camel wouldn't steal? But Avram Avinu was greater than Rav Pinchas ben Yoyer. And if Rav Pinchas ben Yoyer's donkey would not, would not eat something which isn't kosher, why would Avram Avinu's uh, camel steal? But according to Arachayim HaKadosh, that according to the principle we just um, demonstrated, this is not a question. Certainly Avram Avinu was greater than Rav Pinchas ben Yoyer. But Avram Avinu was before the Torah was given. Before the Torah was given, nature is not subservient and subject to the masters of Torah. There, are, there is no Torah. There are no... Uh, there are no great tzaddikim who have mastered the Torah. Even though they had some degree of understanding, but it was not given to man yet. That being the case, Avram Avinu had no choice but to muzzle his camels. But Repinchas ben Yair was after the Torah was given. After the Torah is given, who controls the world? Who runs the world? Those who study Torah have a certain mastery over creation. They could go to a river, and if need be, they could split the river. Says Arachayim Hakadosh, a very novel interpretation of a pasuk in Yeshayahu. The pasuk says like this: The pasuk says, "Koy Amar Hashem Yaakov." Literally, so says the Lord, your Creator, Jacob. Okay, so literally, so says the Lord, your Creator, and who does the Creator speak to? Yaakov. Says Arachayim Hakadosh, this could be read: "Koy Amar Hashem," so says the Lord. Boiracha, you know who's now the creator of the world? Yaakov. Those who study the Torah. Those who study the Torah have full mastery over creation. I'll give you the following analogy that is uh, taught by Reb Chaim Velazhenar. So, we have uh, Shir Hashirim. Shir Hashirim is a love song between a, a chasan, a groom, and a kala and a bride. But it's an, it's an allegory. The groom is God Almighty. The bride is the Jewish people. God did not only select us, He loves the Jewish people passionately. God loves every single Jew. 
regardless of what level a person is on, regardless of a person's level of education, God loves everybody, every Jew, with more than your mother loves you, more than your father loves you, more than your wife loves you, God loves you. The Rav Hashem loves you. And this, is, this love is described in Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs. So one of the things that the Jewish people, the Kala, say to God, the Chas and the Groom, is, you know what you're like? That means, you're like a horse to me, my dear groom, my dear bride. This is actually what God tells the Jewish people. Now, if you're married, I would highly not recommend you go home and you tell your wife, you know, honey, you know what you're like to me? You're like a horse. Because she will then be serving you hay for supper for the rest of your life. But God says to the Jewish people, you are like horses to me. And not like an ordinary horse, like the horses in Paro's chariot. What does this mean? What's the explanation of this? This has a very deep meaning. Typically when you ride on a horse, so who's in control? Typically the rider's in control. So the rider could speed up the horse, the rider could slow down the horse, the rider, you know, a racer could get the horse to jump, the racer... But there was once a horse and a rider where it looked like the rider was in control, but really the horse was in control. And that is when the Jews went through the Red Sea and Pharaoh and the Egyptians came running after them. It looked like Paro was the rider and was in control and his horse was just following directions. But the Chumash tells us that Hashem inspired the horse, that the horse was running headlong into the sea and Pharaoh was, Stop! What are you doing? I'm going to die! And the horses just ran out of control. So it looked like the rider's in control, but the horse was in control. Says God Almighty to the Jewish people, it looks like I run the world. It looks like I make the rain, and I bring livelihood, and I, I'm in charge of the stock market. It looks like I'm God. It's not true. I don't run the world. I don't bring the rain. And I don't control the stock market. And I don't control your health. You know who does? You do. It looks like I'm the rider and you're the horse, but you're the kind of horse in, fa- in Paro's chariots. That You know why the stock market goes up? When Jews wear tefillin, when Jews pray, when Jews don't talk by their prayers or take out their cell phones during their prayers, and they're committed to the observance of the Torah, then the world is successful. Then people are healthy. Then, then the rain falls. Then there's bounty. Then there's livelihood. It looks like I control the stock market. The stock market has nothing to do with me, says God. Yeah, I make it go up when you allow me to. I make the rain fall when you allow me to. So it looks like I control the world. It's not true. You control the world, Israel. You control the world. That's why there's a verse that says, when we say this every morning in our prayers, Tenu Oizalekim, we empower God. We empower Him to give us health, to give us happiness, to give us success. And when we don't observe properly, the Pasuk says, Tzor Yeladcha Teshi. We make God weak. Now, this is only an analogy. God's existence is intrinsic and is completely beyond, is not, is not affected by our actions. But the way He manifests Himself in this world is dependent on how we act. So it looks like He's the Creator. We're the Creator. This is the principle of Rav Chaim Velazhenar. In fact, Rav Shach, the way he looks and understands this concept and this principle is as follows. He says, let's compare and contrast God before He gave us the Torah and after He gave us the Torah. Before the God gave the Torah to the Jewish people, so God says, Moshe, you want the Torah? Come upstairs to heaven. And the verse says, Moshe, Allah, El Holakim. Moshe went up to God. So that should illustrate to us that before the Torah was given, the controls of the universe, the reins of the universe is up in heaven. God controls the world. And if you need anything, you got to go up and get it. But what happened once the Torah was given? God said, You make for me a home and I'll live by you. Meaning you run the world and you, you will control me. You want bracha, you want blessing, you want success, you want happiness. Then it's not dependent on me anymore. It's dependent on you. You follow the rules, you have whatever you need. You don't follow the rules, it's bad news. That's all. It's as simple as that. 
That's the dramatic difference between before the Torah was given and after the Torah was given. You have a question? Yeah. So before Matan Torah, your Averas didn't have Hashpa on the running of the world. The Averas, or the mitzvahs of the Averas didn't have Hashpa on the running of the world? You want to know, before the Torah was given, were the actions of mankind, did it affect the universe? Well, we're saying the, afterwards, this is how it works, we affect, so then before it didn't? We, so we, I would have said that I'm not, I don't have to, I, I have not locked myself into, certainly the actions of the rest of mankind did not, and even the actions of the forefathers. The it brought the mubble, the actions of the Torah mubble brought the mubble. That was God doing it. In other words, God ran the world, and God was not pleased with how they behaved, so he had no choice but to punish mankind. But we wouldn't view it that they brought it upon themselves through their own actions. In other words, now, now if, if uh, there is success in the world, we brought it up. If there's so now tragedy, Medikin and Gemida is our own... Yeah. We're there. What was Medikin and Gemida before the Torah was created? Before the Torah was, was created, the actions of man were not necessarily programmed into the, all the Olamites, no. Nefesh Chaim writes that explicitly, and the Ramchal writes that, that at Matan Torah, sort of God hire, hardwired us into creation, where our, our every action, and not only action, even our thoughts, meaning if somebody has an improper thought, that affects the entirety of the universe. Well, before the Torah was given, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. Let's contrast the, another uh, interesting observation. In the times of Yoshua ben Nun, another body of water split. Which body of the water? The Yardin, when the Jews entered Israel for the first time. They come to the Jordan, and Yehoshua ben Nun tells the Kohanim, the priests, do me a favor, walk into the Yardin, put your feet in the, in the Yardin, and the Pasuk says, the moment the legs, the feet of the Kohanim, step foot in the Yardin, the sea split. They didn't need the coffin of Yosef. They didn't need Nachshon ben Aminadav to jump in. They didn't have to argue. The Yardin didn't say, I'm created on day, day three and you're created on day six. The Yardin split immediately. Why is that? How could Yoshua ben Nun accomplish what Moshe Rabbeinu was not able to accomplish? The answer is exactly what we just said. Rabbi Cheskel Abramsky explains that yes, Moshe was greater than Yehoshua. Moshe was the rabbi and Yeshua was the disciple. But nevertheless, Moshe needed to split water before the Torah was given. So he had a hard time doing it. Yeshua was able to be, was fortunate to be in a situation where he came to the body of water after the Torah was given. So he had a difficult time. Okay. But what I want to focus on uh, this afternoon, would I have 10 more minutes? What do I have? Yeah. Something like that. Is very briefly, I want to share with you, an incredible approach to, I would say, the entirety of Talmud Bavli. Because yes, we've just contrasted Miracles before the Torah was given and miracles after the Torah was given. That miracles became easier after the Torah was given. Yet if you look through the pages of the Gemara and the Talmud, we will notice that the miracles performed by the Amoram, by the sages of the Talmud, were like a piece of cake. Not only were they a piece of cake, they were constant and they were regular and they were like just pedestrian, ordinary. It happened all the time. <clears throat> but let's first establish the following principle. In Judaism, there's a, there's a phenomenon, it's called Yeridas Hadarais. That means as we move away from Sinai, as we progress <coughs> through history, as we move away from the giving of the Torah, the generations become less and less. Meaning, we are, we are considered not as spiritually strong as our grandparents, as our great-grandparents, as our great-grandparents. Meaning, as we move away from Sinai, we're considered to decline. And there are many, many Gemaras that illustrate this. The Gemara tells us, in Masech Yuma, better is the fingernail of the earlier generations than the stomachs of the later generations. Now what does that mean? We know the fingernail is the most expendable part of the body. In fact, you cut it off. People cut off. The stomach is the most critical part of the body. All the internal or organs are in the stomach. The heart, the liver, the kidneys, the, the pancreas, it's all in the stomach. And the Gemara says, they... The fingernails of the earlier generations were greater than the stomachs of the later generations. In other words, we don't even come up to their toenails. And there are many, many such Gemaras that say, if the earlier generations were kings, then we are mere uh, ordinary citizens. If they were ordinary citizens, then we're like donkeys. And the Gemara says, and not even like the donkey of Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yar. Okay? So there's a concept that as we move away, 
from Sinai, we become lower and lower and lower. And yet, if you look through the pages of the Talmud, the Amoraim, the sages of Talmud Mavli, were able to accomplish miracles in much greater capacity than the miracles in the Tanakh. I'll give you a few examples. Revival of the dead. Anybody know? In the, in the Chumash, in the five books of Moses, how many times was someone able to revive the dead? Zero. Nobody. Nobody was ever to, able to do it. Not Avraham, not Yitzchak, not Yaakov, not Moshe. Nobody ever revived the dead. How about in the pages of Nevi'im and Ksuvim? Was anyone able to revive the dead? Eliyahu and Elisha. They were the only ones who were able to do it. And they had a hard time doing it. It says that when Elio had to revive the dead, he put his hands on the child's hands and his mouth on the mouth, and he had to perform this sort of a CPR, resuscitation, revivication, and he was able to do it. Now let's turn to the pages of the Gemara. The Gemara says in Baba Kama Dav Kuf Yud Zayin that there was a sage by the name of Rabbi Yochanan, and Rabbi Yochanan was giving a class, and there was a rabbi in the class, his name was Rav Kahana, and Rav Kahana looked like he was smirking, yeah? And Rav Yochanan thought, Rav Yochanan had, was a beautiful man. He was one of the most handsome people who ever lived. And he had very long eyelashes. So he lifts up his eyes and he looks at Rav Kahana and it looked like Rav Kahana was mocking him. Now back in the day, the sages were such powerful people that if they would look at you bad, you would die. That's just the reality. There are people like that, you know, they have this gaze. And you don't, you don't want to disturb them. Because if they give you that look, that's, a, that's the end. And in the times of the Talmud, if Rabbi Yochanan looked at Rav Kahana, and Rav Kahana died on the spot. He turned into a pile of bones, the Gemara says. So they told Rabbi Yochanan, hey, why'd you do that? Rav Kahana is a good man, he wasn't laughing at you. So Rabbi Yochanan said, oh, I didn't know. And Rabbi Yochanan said, get up! And Rav Kahana came back to life. Another Gemara, there's a Gemara um, in Megillah, famous Gemara. Can I say over the story of Rabbi and Rabbi Zerah? Rabbi once invited Rabbi Zerah on Purim, and they were drinking on Purim, and they got carried away by their drinking, and Rabbi got up and he slaughtered Rabbi Zerah, he killed Rabbi Zerah. So they woke up in the morning, and Rabbi said, Hey Rabbi Zerah, did you have a good time at the Purim fest? And Rabbi Zerah is dead. And Rabbi said, Oh, what did I do? Okay Rabbi Zerah, get up! And he brought Rabbi Zerah back to life. Or the Gemara says, Rav Hananya ben Chachinai, back in the day, the way it would work is, after you got married, you would go to the yeshiva and to study for many years. So, Rav Hananya ben Chachinai said, Hey, uh, honey, wait for me here, I'll be back in like 10 years, and then we'll set up, we'll start a family. So he comes back, and she's there. She hadn't moved, because she died like a day later, and she's been dead on the couch for 10 years. He said, oh, I'm so sorry, get up! And she came back to life. In fact, the Gemara says in Avodah Zara that any sage mentioned in the Gemara it was able to revive the dead. So how could it be? In the Nevi'im, only Elio and Elisha. And they had a hard time doing it. And yet, in the pages of the Talmud are replete with miracle upon miracle upon miracle. In the Chumash, was anybody able to make it rain? No. In the Nevi'im, was anybody able to stop it from rain? Only Eliyahu. And he had a hard time doing it. He had to negotiate with God. He had to say, okay, I'll give you this key, you give me that key, and it's a whole discussion. And you know what Amemar says in the Gemara Masech Tainus? He says that if the world didn't need rain, I would abolish the concept of rain. What do you say? Avraham Avinu couldn't do that. Elisha couldn't do that. Yeshaya couldn't do that. How could Amemar just say, I would abolish the concept of rain? Who had an easier time splitting the sea, Yehoshua ben Nun or Pinchas ben Yair? Pinchas ben Yair. Pinchas ben Yair said, split for me, split for my uh, friend bringing the Karm Pesach, and split for my Arab attendant. So, but they were both after the Torah was given. I'll give you one more example. I don't want to hold, I don't want to hold you up, Arab Shabbos. I'll give you one more example. Hanani Mishal Vazaria, they're thrown into the fire. A miracle happened, and they were saved. So the Gemara asks, how can we never hear of them after the episode of them being thrown in the fire? They're not mentioned again in the pages of Nach. 
the Gemara says it was such a big miracle that it drew so much attention, it was an ayin hara, and they had to disappear. They had to be out of the public light. Really, it was such a big miracle. You know, the Gemara says Reb Zera would go into the oven every 30 days to test himself if he was um, protected from fire because he wanted to elevate himself so high that he would never have to go to the purgatory. So he would intentionally put himself in an oven every 30 days. Wait a second, I thought it was a big deal for Hanani Mishal Vazar. They had a scram, skedaddle, after they're thrown into the fire and Reb Zera would intentionally go into the oven every single day. Or the story of Mar Ukva and his wife. Mark and his wife would give tzedakah to the poor privately, secretly. And they never wanted the poor to know that it was them. So one time uh, the poor man opened the door and he realized, oh, um, a rabbi and his wife m- uh, must have dropped something off. Let me discover who it is. So he ran after the rabbi and uh, the rabbi didn't want the poor man to know so they hid in the oven. Well, I thought that's like a big deal to hide in an oven. So I'm going to tell you uh, this afternoon the great chidosh of the Baal HaLashem. The Baal HaLashem was Rav Shloima El Yashiv, one of the great all-time Mekubalim, where most of his Sfarim is completely incomprehensible to the layman. Most of it is, is very uh, deep and profound Kabbalistic secrets. But there happens to be like one or two pages in one of his Sfarim that are considered the revealed part of the Torah that I would like to share with you very briefly um, in the two minutes that we have left. And this really will put into perspective to us three eras in Jewish history. And that is the Baal HaLashem, Rav Shlomo El Yashiv. Chavetz Chaim said about him that if you're alive, when he's alive, get to see him now because in the world to come, he's going to be so far ahead. In fact, the Baal HaLashem, his right arm was paralyzed. He couldn't, he couldn't move it, except when he wrote the Sefer HaLashem, his hand moved miraculously at lightning speed to be able to write thousands of pages. Okay. I, w- I had the zchus to be at his kever, at his um, grave in Anhar Hazesim, right opposite the Temple Mount. He says as follows, In the time of the second Mesa Mikdash, second temple, now we're talking about 2,500 years ago t- till 2,000 years ago, approximately. 2,100 years ago till 2,000 years ago. That time, the Jewish people were on a much lower level. We did not have many things that we had in the times of the first temple. We didn't have the fire from heaven. We didn't have the Urim Vatumim. We didn't have the Ark, so the, the, the Aron, the Ark where, that has the Luchos. We did not have the Shechina, the Divine Presence. We did not have Ruach HaKodesh. However, God, for reasons that are beyond our ability to fathom, decided to open up the heavens, And to give to the Jews of that generation and the sages of that generation a much deeper understanding of the process of the oral law. Of the Yud Gimel Midoy Shatur and Adreshus Behem. Of the 13, it's called hermeneutical principles through which the the, uh, arguments of Talmud Bavli are based upon. So in other words, until the second temple, there was Chumash, there was Mishnah, and there was basic halacha, but the methodology of Talmudic analysis was not yet revealed to the world. And since the principle is that the governing of the universe and the keys of the universe rest in the hands of the masters of the Torah, there was never a time in history where the heavens opened up and God gave so much intuition and understanding of the process of learning than in the time of the second Beis HaMikdash, than in the times of the Tanoim and Amoraim that they were able to understand different methodologies of learning, be it the concept of Kava Chomer, Gezei Rashava, um, Klal Uprado Klal, and all, to, all the 13 principles of Talmudic analysis that we say in the morning before Pesukah de Zimra. God opened up the heavens and gave to those sages new avenues of understanding and analysis of Torah. More than the prophets even, meaning the prophets just saw God. But the sages of the later generations, they didn't have such clear vision. They were given deductive powers of reasoning to get to the same place the Nevi'im got in darkness. You know, you could just see the truth or you could sort of figure out how to get there. God gave them the intuition how to uh, utilize Talmudic analysis and with that came the absolute control over the universe in an unparalleled way. And therefore the Tanam and Amaram of the Gemara had a stronger control over nature than even the prophets. Why? We don't know why. We could just observe the facts. 
And this may answer, you know, sometimes you may read stories about how in the 15th century, 16th century, in Safad and Sfas, the Kabbalists, the Mekubalim, they were able to perform miracles and all kinds of supernatural feats. And you say, wait, wait a second, uh, how come other rabbis couldn't do that? How come other eras in history couldn't do that? And the answer may be, because God selected that generation to be the disseminators of the wisdom of Kabbalah, along with that came also an unusual and supernatural control over the universe. So the upshot is, here's the executive summary of today's shir. There are three eras in Jewish history. There's pre-Torah. Pre-the Torah was given, miracles are very difficult. Avram Ravina is going to have to muzzle his donkey. Moshe Rabbeinu is going to have a hard time splitting the sea. We have post-Torah. The prophets, Yeshua ben Nun, will have an easier time splitting the sea. Eliyahu could revive the dead. Elisha could revive the dead with a degree of difficulty. But the ultimate display of control over creation was accomplished in the times of the sages of the Mishnah and Gemara, where they were given all the principles of Talmudic analysis and all the methodologies of learning, and along with that came utter mastery over all of creation in an unparalleled way that we, know, we never see not in the Ksuvim, not in the Nevim, and not in the Chumash itself. And this is the, the approach of Rav Shlomo Yashev. And I thank all of you for coming. And let's just end that when we learn Torah, today, in 2019, we are learning a document that is invested with such nuclear spiritual energy that it literally controls the world. So if you have the good fortune after a day of work, or maybe even during your work, even for a few moments a day, a few extra moments a day, to learn Chumash, to learn Mishnah, to learn Gemara. You have to understand, this is the most important thing that I'm doing today and that I'm doing my entire life. And it was worthwhile for my soul to travel all the way down from heaven, thousands of miles, to be in this world, which is only a passageway to the world to come. We're only here a short amount of time. We're only here, we hope, 70, 80, 90 years. But it passes by like uh, nothing. If we could grab a few moments of connection to this divine document, it will elevate our souls, it will elevate our friends and our families, and it will elevate the entire world. So thank you so much for joining us today, and I wish all of you bracha batzlacha. You've just experienced another Torah class, brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.